May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Today, let us take a trip to Mount Hermon. Let us take a long way out for what apparently seems to be no good reason, all the way up to this northernmost reaches of Palestine at Mount Hermon. Are we there to look upon those snow-capped mountains where the melt goes into a cave and becomes the spring that feeds the Jordan River? And Jesus says, let us go to Mount Hermon, to the place of Caesarea Philippi. I have a point to make. We're going to take a 40-kilometer 40 40 detour for this point <laughs> we want to make. So if you will look upon your bulletin cover, you will see that when you enter the town of Caesarea Philippi, what you will see are temples temples to the gods. In fact, the city of Caesarea Philippi was once called Panias, after the god Pan, the nature god, because it was such a natural place with full of caves that had springs coming out of them that would gather and pour into the Jordan River. So you'll walk about and you see temples everywhere. Zeus, Athena, Nemesis. Gods everywhere, and most especially to Pan. That's a lot of religious power all in one place. And this is why Philip, son of Herod the Great, decided to rename this place from Panias to Caesarea Philippi in honor of the great Augustus, Emperor Octavian Augustus, Caesarea. He wanted to honor this great emperor. And then he thought he'd throw his own name in there, you know, just to round it out. So it's not only a place of temples to the gods, that honored the religious powers, especially the fertility powers, it now honored another god, Octav Octavian, who is also called Augustus. And there, Philip had the temple of Augustus. And this is where now the center of the imperial cult religious power, temporal power, wedded together. It was a powerful place. And Jesus takes his disciples to this place. It's a huge turning point in the Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus saunters up to the temple of Augustus, and they all lean in and read the inscription. Emperor Augustus Octavian, son of God. What? What? Let's read that again. <laughs> Emperor Oct Augustus Octavian, son of God. Well, everyone knew that was actually Augustus' favorite title for himself. He called himself the son of God whenever he could. He claimed, you know, there was a, the Halley's Comet came by, and he's like, oh, that, that is my, my predecessor, my adoptive father, Julius Caesar, my great uncle. He has become a god, and because he has become a god, I'm a god, and I am a son of God. So... Augustus, when he claimed divinity, consolidated temporal power, religious power, he was the most powerful man 
ever to rule Rome. And so Jesus takes his disciples there, and he's like, hmm, if Augustus is the son of God, what do people say the son of man is? Son of man? Well, that was Jesus' favorite title for himself. And the disciples look at the temples and the statues and the springs, and they're like, well, who are you? Well, some people say Elijah, others say John the Baptist, and some say Jeremiah. And Jesus is like, well, that's pretty good. I mean, they're the prophets. They're great prophets. So is that it? Or who do you say that I am? And Peter, oh, Peter, strong of heart, unreliable, <laughs> steps up and says, you. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And the disciples looked around at all these statues. And they're like, well, yeah, they are all made of rock, huh? Not really alive. And Augustus is dead. So I guess. We serve a living God. But Messiah, son of the living God? You know, we had suspected that Jesus was the Messiah, but you know, Jesus never came out to just confirm this, right? Even John the Baptist from prison, he sends a question to Jesus, hey, uh, are you the one we're supposed to be waiting for? Or are, we, are we supposed to wait for someone else? And then Jesus doesn't answer him. And he's like, well, behold, the oppressed shall be set free and the hungry shall be fed. And so John's like, so is that a yes? <laughs> or a... And, but here, 40 kilometer detour at the base of Mount Hermon, at the temples of Caesarea Philippi, at the temple of Augustus. Jesus says, yeah, I'm the Messiah. And so the disciples got all excited because finally the king of Israel has come back to conquer the Romans, to free them from this oppression, this power that dominates and is located so clearly here. And so they're all imagining, like, okay, what are things we got to do? Sharpen our swords, you know, create a plan of insurrection. And they got very, very excited. But Jesus says, okay, walk with me. Walk with me, everyone. Let's, let's move from the temple of Augustus. I want to take you to the cave, this big, big cave in Caesarea Philippi called the Gates of Hades. This gate, this cave, is the gate to the underworld where all the dead go. I want to make a point at this Gate of Hades. So you all know that when the fertility gods hibernate in the winter. They go through this gate, and they hide in there. And then everyone has to perform the fertility rites to draw out the gods so that we can have good crops. But it is also the domain of the dead. The forces of death are at this gate. Peter. You got it right, but don't make, get a big head about it because it's my Father in heaven who showed you. And upon this rock, 
I shall build my church. And the disciples looked at each other like, whoa, Peter? Peter's a rock? Because Petros means rock, and Peter is Petros. And Jesus said, oh, come on, guys. Remember your reflexive endings in ancient Greek? <laughs> I said, upon this rock, Petra, I will build my church, Ecclesia. Petra and Ecclesia are together, not Petros. It was supposed to be a kind of joke, but I feel like you're going to take this the wrong way. You know, lots of art about keys. And so I give you the keys to the kingdom. And I stand here before the gates of Hades and say to you, it will not prevail upon the kingdom of God. Not even this domain of death will prevail upon the kingdom of God. So whatever you bind on earth, you will bind in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, you will loose in heaven. And they all, <laughs> what is he talking about? Okay, first, he says he's the Messiah. We're getting excited. Then he's talking about rocks and church and keys. These are all things we haven't really heard, like this first use of Messiah in Matthew, first use of church in Matthew, and there's some keys, and then we're not supposed to talk about it. Jesus said, keep it secret. Well, you know, they were getting so excited thinking about all their, what they were going to sharpen, and Jesus very quickly upon this scene, if you read further, we'll be talking to Peter and all of them and say, so I got some more details for you about my messianic role. I'm going to be crucified. And on the third day, I will rise. And Peter was like, wait, what does this have to do with swords? You, it doesn't sound like you're going to be picking up a sword. And, and Peter's like, this is not my vision. How dare you, Jesus? And, G, and Jesus is like, OK, Satan, get behind me. It's like, wait, I was the rock, and now I'm Satan? <laughs> yeah, Peter. <laughs> because you're not getting it. Because at first, you all thought that I was here to lift the occupation. And now I'm telling you something very different about your expectations of what the Messiah will be. And I got something else. You, 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 you must pick up your own cross if you want to follow me. This is even worse news than the first one. OK, first we didn't want our Messiah to suffer, but uh, I, us, us? And he says, yeah. And that's why I'm telling you not to say anything right now, because you don't get it. You don't get it yet. And so we who sit a couple thousand years after this event, do we get it? <laughs> do we understand? what it means to follow Jesus, like what kind of cost that might be. And what are these keys? How does it relate to the church, this gathering? And the, what is the rock? All of these things are still being talked about. We have conversations about what all this really means. But today, I want to offer to you some initial thoughts I have about what is talked about with regard to binding and loosing, and, and what we're willing to do to bind and loose things on earth. And I go to scripture. I go to what Jesus says, bind up the brokenhearted. 
set loose the bonds of injustice. Perhaps these are keys. Perhaps this is what the gate of Hades cannot prevail over. Perhaps that's the work of the ecclesia. And upon this Petra, this rock, the church is built. These are questions for us to ponder and understand that even though Peter gives an amazing theological assertion of who Jesus is, to follow Jesus is much more than saying something profound. It is about enacting this binding and loosing so that what is done on earth is also done in heaven. Amen.